Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor. Today, I'm very excited. We have a very special guest with us today. This is Pastor Williams, and he is a wonderful individual. But before we begin, I just want to give a quick shout out to DMA Consulting. DMA Consulting is a marketing consulting agency that looks out for the little businesses. Its focus is to help the little businesses not get scammed by those large corporate and large marketing companies that charge a fortune and and, you know, really don't do much for the people who are beginning their businesses or trying to just make ends meet. So DMA, dmaworld.com is a great place to go to, to uh, learn how to get your business off the ground. And they charge very reasonable fees and they help little businesses so they don't get scammed by those big marketing companies. So check them out and they are welcoming everybody and they'd love to hear from you guys. So now I'd like to talk to Pastor William. I'm very excited to have you on the show. And Dr. Um, uh, Pastor Williams, he is he focuses on liberation. And he's going to get into that. He's going to tell us a little what he means by the word liberation. But this is a very great topic that I think you really need to listen to because it really affects everybody worldwide. So Pastor Williams, can you tell us a little about yourself, what you do, and talk about a little about what you mean by the concept of liberation? Well, good day, good afternoon, Ms. Chalimi. Uh, it's so great to be on your program. I'm really excited about that. And that's a big compliment because I don't get excited about too much anymore. <laughs> so I'm so grateful <laughs> to be with you. Uh, I'm in the Central Texas Valley and you know, you're in the, the Northeast, so we're like an hour uh, behind you. Uh, liberation, you know, I think is something that is very important to us today because it, it has certain types of connotations in reference to the France Revolution, the American Revolution, slavery, uh, whatever you want to name it. But it means that someone wants to be liberated from being oppressed. Uh, but yeah. really and truly, liberation is all of that and even more. I mean, you can oppress yourself. And sometimes you have to get liberated from yourself, from your emotions, from your feelings, from you know, uh, bad indoctrinations of how you were raised as a child, liberation from genders and these kinds of things. Because we seem to be falling into a society where um, there, there is this scripted type of life, this artificial life. You know, we don't live life. We perform life so we can post life. <laughs> so, so so our real life is is really more for social media and stuff like that. Uh, and 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 the real life we hide away. So, and we need to get liberated from those things to truly enjoy and find out who we are as people, and yeah. be okay with that. You know, provided that we have a basic uh, bridge, uh, a road that we travel, and the road of humanity of that that I cannot prosper, or I can't get everything I want at the expense of you, uh, right. and, and and be okay with what I have and and satisfied with what I don't have. From that aspect and still enjoy life and and that seems impossible today for people because everybody has been sold this bill of goods you know believe it or not it's through even through our own country and 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 the um the doctrines of our country that you can be all that you can be and which then got morphed into you can have everything you want to have and have it right now you know right and, and these kinds of things and that's just not true in the real world um you know it's not true in the real world and it takes opportunities, and 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 you know, if you have a desire to have something bad enough, then you can get manipulated. <laughs> you know, when yeah. as we talked about earlier, what will you not do to uh, to uh, to achieve those things and accomplish those things? So liberation is very important, you know, because it requires a genuine self reflection of self, you know, and you know, do I need this, and and is that really the case that's happening here? What what am I seeing before me? on that process and you know <clears throat> i can you know scapegoat the lgbt community i can scapegoat the you to the, the me too community i can scapegoat the uh, uh the black community the white community i can scapegoat everybody for denying me the things that that i i um should have uh and and there may be uh springs of truth on that and you know this may got that for that but but is that really uh what's holding me back and and what I want, is that really what I need in that process? Right. Or is it what I think I need because it's being marketed to me? So liberation is very key. And it's also ongoing. 
You know, yes. It's not just one liberating, it's an ongoing thing in life. That's a mouthful. So. <laughs> Oh, it's, it, you know, you really made a lot of great points. You know, I find that, you know, today's world, you know, we always had hate, you know, hatred has been around for a very long time, but it, it seems like, you know, when I, when I see, you know, you see the violence and you see the words of hatred being displayed in our society, I, you know, I don't know if it's, be, you know, sometimes I, I say to people, is it because we're just more aware with media or is it, is, is, are things really getting worse in our society? Are, you know, where is all this hate coming from? Where is all, you know, I, 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 we, I never remember all these, you know, uh, violence with guns, people coming in, doing mass shootings, you know, in, in facilities and in schools, you know, I, you know, it's, it's the world has really, I think, taken a turn for the worst in many ways. There's no reason for hatred. There's no reason to, to be so angry towards other human beings. You know, I think a lot of times, you know, I don't know how you feel. We'll find out in a second, but a lot of times when we, we say things to other people, you know, the person that they're, they're, they're verbalizing it to isn't the problem. It's the person who is actually saying the words is the person that has the problem, yes. you know, and it took me a while to realize that in my lifetime because I was always a sensitive person and I always took things, you know, um, literally, but then I realized, but when I was talking to people, they're like, and when people say those mean things or they do mean things, it's not, it's not you, it's them. But how do we change them? How do we change those behaviors? How do we make our country and our world better? Is there is it a possibility that we can liberate, you know, the world from all this, you know, hatred and violence? Great question. And and I'm 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 a Christian pastor. I've been pastoring for 25 years plus. And you know, Christianity doesn't have the best track record. I just finished my latest book, American Christianity: Black Liberation, White Legalism. Uh, but at the same time, I don't fault Christianity for the behavior of Christians you know, mm -hmm. or, or the faith from that aspect, uh, because we need to be liberated as well. But one thing that we're seeing today is we're, see, we're seeing people use the word evil, evil, true evil, pure evil, this and that. Well, if, if we do believe in that and if we don't understand why it's happening, where it's coming from in the Christian faith, at least what I have been taught through seminary is that. There are a lot of thoughts that come to you that you can't control whether it comes or doesn't come. You either mm -hmm. receive it or you reject it. Right. Um, but now, you know, spiritual and, and liberation is really in the realm of spiritual warfare in this essence. And, and well, how, wh why am I not rejecting it? Because it's crafted to tap into something that is personal. It's, it's yeah. a craft. It's, it taps into race. It taps into, ideologies it taps into emotions and feelings and 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 if one is not thinking rationally one it's going to really feed into where your eyes are what you're looking yeah. at uh which may be blinded or how you would say you know manipulated based mm -hmm. on past experiences right uh, and and this is where your heart is from that aspect uh, and the hardest thing to do is to deny the heart um, yeah you know, even though sometimes what the heart wants is not good for you, you know, right? No good for anybody. So you have to deny that, you know, to move on. And 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 this is what we see happening. And it seems it's, it's very difficult to to put put a pause and a break on that. I mean, revenge is sweet, and I must get it. You know, I must have payback. And you know, the, the, you talked about me, so I must now talk about you. Or you got a job that I think I should have had, so it's my mission to make sure you don't enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and the and the, this is a low hanging fruit here uh, in that aspect, but also because what about when it affects you? When you affect you? When you look at yourself and say, you know, I, you start to believe that you know I'm not living up to the norms of society. I need my weight is not where it needs to be, and you know I you know I'm 46 years old, but I need my stomach to be flatter. <laughs> uh, uh, that or I need to be. Yeah, and then you start to believe that, and 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 now you start to get enslaved to words from people that you've right. never met. Yeah. Uh, so from that aspect, and so liberation is once again spiritual warfare because it's really a, a reconditioning of the mind to find out who you are and whose you are, 
You know, yeah. What is your fidelity to your creator and to yourself? Right. Very true. And stop yeah, committing think... adultery to the cosmetic society or to the financial industry and these kinds of things. Yeah. So by yeah. selling yourself to them. I feel sometimes, you know, we get so caught up in what the media tells us and people, you know, um, it's very sad, but a lot of times, you know, people will watch TV or they'll listen to the media or they'll watch, you know, videos and they believe everything they hear. And, you know, they could say that the, the, the that the sky is purple and they will believe it. And, you know, it has, you know, our, our words, you know, um, you know, I, I always said the words of wisdom is so powerful, but it depends where those words are coming from. And, you know, a lot of times you see now people, you know, they, they believe what they hear. You have conspiracy groups, you have, you know, groups of hatred, you know, spreading more hatred and you have, you know, a lot of negative, you know, um, impact and voices, you know, and people are being influenced. And, you know, how do we get out of that influence? How do we help people really take a step back and, you know, not be influenced and maybe examine who they are as a person and, and be able to actually, you know, focus on the good of themselves, which is very easy to say, but not so easy to do. Well, you, you have a society that is really and truly as morphed into a dependent society it's it's set up in a class conscious society with an upper middle and a lower uh mm -hmm. and, and there's a subservient nature to the person who may have the most money gets the most respect whether they deserve it or not right uh, uh, the financial power of money and what money can do it can buy exclusivity it can buy great lives and stuff and if you want that i, I wrote a series of books called the corporate christian you know, Christian beliefs, corporate behaviors. There was one and the second and the third one. And it's a very powerful series because it deals specifically a very simple explanation to what you're talking about is, you know, when you get a job, you're very excited and, and, and you'll say, oh my God, God bless me for this job. And I love this job and I'm going to do this job. And and you get that job and, and then you go in and that job has, you know, by nature, it has two natures. It has a promoter culture and a subculture. Yes. And they'll tell you that we're here for you. We're going to give you vacation time. We're going to give you benefits. We're going to develop you. We're going to train you. We're going to do all those things for you. And, and we want to make you be the best that you can be in all that process there. So it tells you all that stuff. But at the same time, what ends up happening is you also run smack dead into and feel the subculture, which is the right. cronyism, the favoritism, the nepotism, you know, the corruption, the jealousy and the envy. So you hear one, but you feel the other. That yeah. Process. And, and, and now that leaves you in, in a standard of confusion. And then you, because you're, you're, you're dependent on people to, you know, tell you you're always doing good and you feel you need the, the pat of back, you know, we create a subculture. And right. that subculture is that, um, like in jobs and societies, if I can't get what I want the real way, I'll find another way to get it, you know? So yeah. I'll, I'll deal in crime or I'll join the gossip and the slander and, and that stuff there, you know, and try to get in that way. I'll sleep my way up there to the top, whatever, whatever subculture works to get me there and, and be quite okay with that and justify for that because the place is the way it is and I can't get in any other way. And this is where we lose ourselves because now we're not, we have now conformed and not transformed. Yeah. You know, above it. And, and, we see this happening, you know, and my books talk about in a corporate setting, you know, and, and the battle for liberation and to, yeah. to be true to, to oneself. But in society, you see it happen the same way, too, that that I I need to be part of. And, and many people like to identify themselves by what they do. You know, yeah, I am a Christian. I am a doctor. I am a Democrat. I am a Republican. And they show fidelity and loyalty to to these groups, uh, and and afraid to call them out when they do when they do wrong, They're right? Ostracized from there. Right. So once again, the individual is no longer an individual. So. No, that's very true. You know, and a person is conforming to that whatever group 
you know, that they are, they're labelizing themselves towards yeah. those groups and they're becoming what those groups represent, but they themselves may not represent those behaviors deep down inside, you know, over the course of the time, they've kind of molded themselves to become something that maybe they weren't, they're really not meant to be. You know, if you really look deep down inside somebody, a lot of times people will get so mixed up in the world or the 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 group that they belong to that they forget over time who they really are as a person. And you could ask them, who are you? What's your purpose in life? You know, and ask them, you know, you know, what do you really enjoy? You know, what do you like? What, you know, what's your aspirations and goals? And they'll just sit there and look because they don't know because they focus so much on that group that they've right. been, they've been, you know, trying to idolize and, and trying to mimic, mimicize that they've actually lost track of who they are as a person. And they'll give you the answers to what they hear on TV or what they think it, that they want to be. And, and, and it doesn't match up with who they are as people or what they're qualified to do. Yeah. What I'm talking about is you, you see the very plainly in the arrogancy, like of, of the news media, especially around election time, you look at Fox, MSNBC, NBC, CBS, CNN, and, and, and look how they describe voting blocks of people, the yes. African-American community. This yes. is what they vote for, what they want. You know, right. uh, which is not a monolithic community, you know, right. or uh, the white women from this age group to this age group. This is what they want. Uh, the yeah. ones who are educated and 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 this is how they vote. <laughs> you know, and, yes. and it's played out right before you. Uh, uh, and and I think that, you know, when, when people reject that, you know, oh, my God, something's going wrong. You know, but this is the society we lived in. We've always labeled and you know, documented and 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 census taking, which is part of Rome and everything else. But we've taken a little further than that. We've we've done it to put people in class, socioeconomic classes and stuff like that. Yeah. Even down to your 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 employment application. You know, are you black, non Hispanic? Are you Caucasian? Are you other? And and yeah. <laughs> you know, what difference does it make? It you know? doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, but, I feel yeah. anyway. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, go ahead. Finish what you have to say. I'm sorry. I just feel that it, 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 it the more we know, the less we know. Uh, and yeah, you know, Very one true. thing I've, I've learned about education is, uh, and I heard you know, Dr. Carson talk about this. He's a very wonderful man. The more education you have, the more you realize that you don't know because okay. you, you're educated enough to know. A person who has no education thinks they know everything. Right. Because they have no point of reference to what's out there. So, but, but those who do know what's out there realize how little they do know, you know, so it's supposed to at least keep you humble for what you have. And that's very true. That That's so true. And I get so angry because, you know, there is so much labelizing and so much stigmatism in our world. And people think because you're this, you have to be this. And, you know, every individual is their own person. Every individual is different from one another. So why do we have to be labelized or stigmatized according to color or race or gender, you know, or what sexuality we are? We're all different and we all have, but we're all similar in a lot of ways also, you know, and that's what makes us unique is that we do carry a lot of similarities as humans and we do carry differences that make us unique as a, as a whole, as a whole human being. But, you know, it, it makes me angry that people have to stigmatize and think because you're this, oh, you won't be able to do this. Or because you're that, you know, you won't be as good as the other person, you know, but it's like, you know, how do you know, what do we do? It's like, you know, is there really a solution out there? Is there something that we can do to help, you know, make this world a better place? Because I feel like we're going back in history instead of moving forward. I feel like things are, you know, that that we're not, you know, things aren't getting better. We're not advancing in a lot of ways. I feel like we're going backwards in a lot of ways. Well, you know, and and you use a very powerful word when you call to talk about stigma. Because stigma is a very powerful word because you, when you stigmatize a, a group of people or a person or a gender, that's how they're seen before they even get in the room. Your stigma gets to the place before you do. Yes. So when you get there, your stigma and what they think of you is already waiting on you. 
And now yes. it's up to you to work twice as hard to change their minds by how you sound, how you look, how you dress from that process. Right. That, I, I look at that because we live in a very, com in, in my humble opinion, we live in a very competitive society in America and around the world. Mm -hmm. And and stigma stigmatization helps me get a leg up. So if I can stigmatize the LGBTQ community, if I can stigmatize the gay community, you got to watch them this and that, or the black community, then it helps. Well, you know, I am the, I am the alternative to that. <laughs> so right. yeah, so so let me get the break in a sense, and 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 I may not even be nowhere near more qualified than 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 the people I'm stigmatizing. But it exactly. gives me the leg up in a sense. I mean, that's a simple mindset. But in my 41 years of work and retirement, this is how, I mean, people should not have to. I heard Malcolm X say, uh, you know, that we don't need any more laws in America. You know, our founding fathers were very smart. And if we were to enforce the laws that are already there equally across the board, we wouldn't need you know, um, civil rights uh, legislation. We wouldn't need um, the birth control and we wouldn't need all these enforcements. You know, you'd almost put law enforcement out of work in, a, in yeah. essence, a significant part of it. If you were to just, you know, maintain and be obedient to the laws of the land that were that are already on the books. Right. But, you know, because people want to have voting power. They want to have representation power. They want to be able to, not just to hold people down, but, you know, for greed to, to, to get, you know, corporate yeah. monies and business deals inside of trading and stuff like that. So, you know, and then it spills over into other social aspects of, of, of life in the country. But everything that you need is already there. You know? Yes. It's like salvation. <laughs> in salvation, is not even saved, but, you know, gifts of wisdom and patience and, and, and long suffering and temperance and human development is all part of that there. You know, right. it all comes with that. So. Um, if you decide to open it up and use it and apply yourself to it. Yes, very true, very true. Will that happen? Well, I hope so, but I think that we've kind of gotten very accustomed to being chaotic. Yeah. So when abnormalcy becomes normal, that's what mm -hmm. we have, so. Yeah, and I noticed a lot of, we became more chaotic during COVID, you know, like I think a lot of behaviors changed, a lot of ways of thinking changed, um, the ways of living changed, and it really, I think, it mentally and really put a, a, a physical damper into a lot of people's um, view. Um, you know, I just, I, you know, since COVID, things have changed, you know, dramatically, you know, and uh in my last book, uh, American Christianity, one of the things I wrote about, you know, it, 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 it talked about many topics across the board. We tapped into historical events. We tapped into um, legislation that's passed. We tapped into the church and the ecumenical ministry and the history of the, of the church, you know. Uh, but one of the things we talked about is being resistant for resistance sake. For mm -hmm. no rhyme or reason. And, you know, I retired as a chaplain. I worked for Kings County Hospital in Brooklyn. You mm -hmm. know, I was a chaplain my last seven years there and I ran the entire program and I worked right through the pandemic. Right. Uh, and I was going in rooms um, when the masks and stuff weren't there. Yeah, and thank God I didn't get sick. I was on all the committees. I was with the doctors and and and, and their groups and counseling them and because you know, there were times when it got very hairy, where scary, where the Hippocratic Oath was, you know, something came out that we're not going to resuscitate patients. Because right. Resuscitation, you push down and they exhale, and we didn't yeah. know what was coming out. So they didn't, so we people were just being allowed to die in a sense. I didn't say we let people die. We, we tried to bet, but there was a fear about that. And Governor Cuomo was supposed to give immunity that never came, and so we didn't know really what to do. Uh, but in the midst of all of that, some of our Western and Southern states decided this was a hoax. Mm -hmm. It wasn't true. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and three or four months later or three, seven to eight weeks later in the summertime, they started opening up around the 4th of July. And and so we're going to go out there and then you know, we can't close our country down. We're going to et cetera. And, and that was a decision. Now we know that they knew that they were making that decision. But other people suffered from that. And then you yeah. started seeing really massive, you know, death ratios 
in the smaller Midwestern states and the state I'm in now in Texas and stuff like that, that, that to this day have kind of devastated those states as far as economic development and businesses not coming back and family members that have passed, you know, so because we lost well into millions of people in this country. Yeah. And you think about, well, maybe if we were a little patient, right. if we held out a little longer for another eight to nine months, you yeah. know, what could have happened as a society, as a country, you know, yes. and instead of rushing to do that, just find ways to be, you know, creative and ingenuitive. So maybe let's pick up the phone and call each other. Let's, you know, do some other things and, yeah. you know, let's start reading books again or in our backyards and stuff. And, you know, how, how have you can do that? I mean, if, if we could, you know, or, you know, but other yeah. than just going out there, but just to resist a resistance state, because the motivation for opening up was to go against the federal government and what they were doing. And it's bad for you. The government's not going to tell you what to do. And, we're going to do our thing and open up and go against the medical establishment and, and all those things just to be resistant. And it, it, it costs dearly. It costs us dearly. Yeah. Being a Christian pastor, I'm very familiar with death because the bereaved don't call their psychologists. They call their pastors. Yeah. And, and then you go and you counsel and the funerals I've done and a lot of them, most of them were done for free because it happened so sudden. Um, it's just a terrible thing to, to, to walk families through that, you know, and, yeah. and, you know, to know that it could have been avoided, you know, there's also, right. you know, so it, it really reflects on, on, on how much about of our humanity do we really care about, you know? And yes. like you said, when you talk about since COVID, look what you have now, look, look what came out of that. Look at our political structure, look at our, psyche as a country look how we do we care about each other probably not as much as we should you know? right no very true and, and one thing i noticed too is that i learned from from covid and, and just even watching videos and watching people's reactions a lot of people didn't like the fact that people were telling them what to do don't you know wear masks don't do this make sure you wash your hands and da 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 and people you know you know people were against it and you know i remember there was one one gentleman on youtube and they he was against wearing masks and he would burn the mask and he would make a big ruckus and he would post these videos and it ended up that this gentleman ended up getting covid and he died from it and he was the one on YouTube protesting against wearing masks and taking precautions and da da da, da you know, um, you know, it's all a conspiracy, blah, blah, blah. And then he ended up dying from COVID. So, you know, the, the fact that people, you know, people just don't like to follow the rules. You know, a lot of people, people don't, they want to be the ones to make their own decisions. But you know, when people are trying to even help them, you find that in human life also, when you sometimes you, people don't want to hear what you have to say, unless you they ask for it, you know, and that's a, a flaw in our society where it goes, you know, the, when it goes deep down to the root of things, it's, it's psychological, you know, but it's uh, people don't like to be told what to do, whether it's for the good or for the bad, you know, they don't care if it's going to help them. They don't like to be told what to do. I, I, and I'm going to I'm going to go back to the word liberation because there <laughs> there is a disingenuous disingenuousness about our society today, and, and I talked about you know living more in the artificial world than the real world, right? So you know I'm going to use whatever I can to get the spotlight because you know the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said the most intoxicating drug that ever hit humanity is the TV camera. <laughs> <laughs> true there's nothing more powerful than notoriety so mm -hmm. i'm going to burn masks not among my friends in the privacy of my home i'm going to burn mask uh in my i'm going to burn mask so so no one uh but, but everybody will see um on youtube to get likes yeah. yes and, and 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 the biggest thing i want out of that is not how many people I'm leading to the grave, <laughs> yeah. but how many people are liking, you know? So, and, and then you say, well, I'm resisting because I don't want to be told what to do. Well, how old are you? 25, 35, 45, you have a job? Okay, mm -hmm. but then you know what it is to be told what to do. 
You're told right. what time to come to work. You're told what time to leave. You're told you have to take a lunch break and this and that. So, you know, we as a society have always been told what to do. Yes, very true. We, we operate and that's the foundation of this work is 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 embedded in the American society. We're hardworking people. I love Bob Seger like a rock. Chevy built <laughs> or tough. You know, uh, sun on my skin, hard against the wind. <laughs> you know, you know that, that that stuff. So so I like that. So you've been told what to do. So to right. tell me that you don't like to be told what to do to save your life, that's disingenuous. Right. Yeah. That's for you to get YouTube likes. So yeah. and I go back to saying smart people have become completely ignorant yeah. because of the drug of notoriety. Yes. You know what? That's an excellent point. That's an excellent point. It's very true. And 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 it's it, it's that young man on YouTube. It's our politicians. It's the White House. It's on, on, in both parties. That TV camera, yes. you know, it voids service, quiet, humble service, yes. without notoriety. You know, service for service sake. Yes. Know? It, it, and 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 it really brings a, a disingenuousness to our mm -hmm. charity, to our conversations. Yes. Uh, yes. That thing and and as I, <laughs> I told you before we went on there, I'm a nosy person. I'm, I'm a people watcher, so I watch and I don't judge. But you know, you see and you make connections of dots. And I do that yes. because I want to want to make sure that that the things that I practice when I preach, I try to serve. You know, without. Um, conditions you know yes so so, so, so you don't pay you know, you know you know i know pastors have a very bad reputation you know trust me when i tell you you know you don't want to be a pastor you know, i'm a poor <laughs> pastor i've been pastoring you know for 25 years i still make 300 bucks a month when i'm in church <laughs> there's no pension <laughs> plan i i thank god for the job he gave me that i could retire with a pension so right. I've worked by vocationally and I didn't like that for many years, but you know, I was told by someone who said, yeah, but that makes you a better pastor because you have to serve during the week and it makes you a better employee because you lead on the weekends. So, right. so it, 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 you know what to do internally, you know, when that stuff rises up so you can liberate yourself from those crazy emotions and feelings, you know, those temptations, enticements and provocations that, that come your way. Do you think people have made money their God in a sense and to the point where it, it is actually harming our society? Because you turn on any any type of TV program, commercial, commercial, and you go onto YouTube or anything, any of those platforms, and you see how to make 600000 in 30 days, how to do this and how to make your fortune and how to, you know, everything is money driven, money driven, money driven, you know, how to how to become famous, how to make, you know, tons of money in a short period of time, you know, buy this, do this, you know, listen to this and um, and and people do it. And th those type of people have a large following and, you know is it have people kind of brainwash themselves that it's it's more important to become you know it's more meaningful to have the dollar bill backed by your by your your personality you know who you are or you know like you said you you became a pastor and you lived humbly but you were happy what you did and you did what you had to in order to survive and have a meaningful um life so you know, are people getting too wrapped up with, you know, trying to put this persona of money before, you know, the, the, what's important in life? At one time, I think people were making money to gods. I think it's gotten worse. I think people are making themselves gods mm -hmm. uh, uh, with, with the, the right, divine right to rule, the divine right to be successful. You right. Know, I have a right to be rich. I have a right have authority you know i mean and uh, uh, we call that legalistic from the old english you know uh aristocracy that i was born into this so yeah. I, I have a right to be in charge i have a right to be in the upper epsilon based on family name you know right you don't uh and that's dangerous you know yeah that, that's dangerous so so you have people so we see this thing happening all the time here give me i drop something uh so we have we see people going through this stuff and and trying their best to see how we can do it without letting it be so offensive, right? Um, so there's hypocrisy tied to it, 
Yeah, so so people feel that they have a right to be in charge or have a right to, with no experience, you know, you know, very little, you know, my future son-in-law. I, oh yeah, I I went when I got my job at UPS. I told him, you know, I could do his job. I said, let me get this straight. You're this age. You've been on that job four months. You tell your supervisor has been there 25 years that you can do his job. I said, I fire you too. <laughs> <laughs> I'd fire you on the spot too. <laughs> I mean, because clearly I don't need UPS doesn't need that kind of ignorance working with them. So right. no, I mean, so you know, this this divine right, uh, you know, and, and God bless him. He's a wonderful, I don't want to disparage him. He's a wonderful young man yeah. and, and he's learned a lesson and he's he's a great employee, he's humble and stuff like that. Um, I, I just feel that that we have made ourselves and we've talked ourselves into that we are entitled to, we deserve to have. And, yes. and I'm, I'm not quite sure where that came from. Um, and because you can't have without work. Right. And work doesn't come without sweat. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and and that doesn't happen without long hours of labor. And, and well, you know, that's your generation, Pastor. That's not my. When did it change? Yeah. Yeah. When Very true. Change? You know, I, I come from a, a family of entrepreneurs and I have, I know lots of people who have their own businesses and, and the biggest problem that they see is trying to find good workers because either they want too much money or they don't want to work. They don't want to work the hours and businesses are struggling and, you know, they can't you know, stay open and they can't make the money they can, they used to make because people don't either want to work the hours or they're asking for money way above the means of that occupation that they're, they're trying to, you know, um, go for. And it, and what it, you're saying now is a new thing because the biggest problem in challenge of business is to get capital. Yeah. To get mm -hmm. funding and finances because people don't want to, oh, I don't know if I want to invest in you. I know in my business, when I had it, you know, I, and I survived 14 years, you know, right. but it was difficult to get funding. Now to yeah. add on a labor problem, you know, it's just almost impossible for businesses to succeed nowadays. You know? Yeah. It's, and it's, it's terrible. And I'm, and I feel bad for a lot of these business owners and it's just, it's something that we've seen just recently, you know, this behavior, but it's like, it's like, I don't know, you know, how do we liberate that? How do we change the mindset and make people realize that they are, that they need to be more humble and that they need to be more appreciative and they, that they're not as high on the ladder. Just like you mentioned about your son-in-law, you know, he thought he could do the same job that his supervisor of 25 years could do. You know, that's the same attitude that you see a lot of people walking into a, a job set and, you know, interviewing. They want X amount of dollars, you know, and they want only to work X amount of days, but they want, you know, this outrageous amount of money, you know, and, uh, you know, you well, see I, that more. I think that, you know, we can do it if we stop being lazy. We can't outsource this to celebrities. We can't outsource this to leaders. I mean, mm -hmm. people who we call leaders are not leaders. You know, it doesn't, you don't go to leadership school to become a celebrity you know, yeah, uh, or, or have money. Um, yeah. you, this has to be done impromptu on the spot. When you see it in your niece or your nephew, when you see it in your kids' friends, when you have nights out with your with your girlfriends or your guys and, and you have having, start having good discussions, you know, it, uh, yes. Let, let, let's talk about let this be the topic of the day you know when not from a judging from a political ideology but from a human standpoint for love of country you know there's yeah. an enemy within that we have to talk about and 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 that old saying you know i met the enemy and the enemy was me right exactly uh, and i have to so i have to change how i think and i gotta teach that on to and and, and show because this kind of teaching is not going to be just wonderful sayings that we can post on Instagram. Yes. <laughs> this is going to be things that you're going to have to apply and implement into your life, you know, where you're going to have to live it, you know, and you're going to have to really feel the pain of tempering your emotions and your anger. Yeah. Uh, I had a young man recently come speak to me. He went through some, a really traumatic situation with a, uh, a young lady he was dealing with and, 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 you know, Kudos to him. You know, I I, I I I had so much respect for this young man. He reached mm -hmm. out to me and said, Pass, I just I just need someone to talk to because of my thoughts. Right. Because he was done wrong. 
he was done wrong. He, he really was done wrong. He was hurt, uh, and, and he was a victim of violence. And he had some really bad thoughts, you know, from what he was saying about poisoning this and going after that and slam. And and you know, we had a conversation. I said, yeah, but that's that's really not who you are, right? He says, and, and you don't want to violate your family name, your history, your parents were put into you. Uh, right. from that aspect and then you don't want to include friends into this kind of behavior they may get in trouble you know right so what kind of friend are you and and then we came to the conclusion that you know this really was a blessing because this is the kind of family that you didn't want to be around anyway yes mm -hmm. unless married into so right. and i really tip my hat to him for really recognizing the changing through provocation and enticements and temptations of his character and nature. I was changing him because something was, and, and the divine need for payback and retribution. Yeah. That he seeked wise counsel to make sure he did not go down that road. And, and this is what, you know, and this came about because of his mom. I knew his mom and his father and, and, and how they were raised. And the, so, how they, you know, and this is what has to happen. I mean, we really have to really not agree with our kids and, and and young people like that you gotta this is not you know all the young people who hang with me and 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 they're in their late 30s and early 40s i have no business no problem shutting them down and saying you're wrong about that you know yeah you know mm -hmm. no matter how big they are or, or whatever you know you're right. okay pastor you're right <laughs> so <but> that's <laughs> that's not the way we think we don't do that you know you know right you know, all women are not this and all men ain't that and, and this and that. So yeah. we have to kind of really, really, you know, nip this kind of thinking in the bud. A lot of times I feel like we need to really, when, when trauma happens in our life, when bad things occur, don't look at it as a bad thing. Step back for a second and pull some positivity out of it because we all go through obstacles and, and trauma in our life at some point. So if we looked at it in a positive sense and say, okay, you know, because eventually, you know, if you notice, no matter what we go through life, we get through it. We, you know, it's not always, a, uh, it's a rough patch as we're going through it, but we eventually get through it. So you say to yourself, what did I learn from this? How did it make me a better person? Did it strengthen me? Did it make me look at life differently? How can I use this as a positive point in my life to make me a better person than to hold that anger in and that hatred in and to and to want to get back at people because of what you had gone through? You're angry and you're frustrated and you want other people to feel your pain. So do you have some tips maybe on how you can help people who who have, ha you know, felt like they have been wronged, ha that have gotten through trauma, they're holding that anger in, they're holding that frustration in, they just want other people to feel their pain because they just don't know how to get rid of that pain. And they want others to feel the way they do because they're miserable inside. So how do we switch that up? Because that's what a lot of this world has become. We got a lot of people with pain, misery, anger, frustration, and it's all inside them. They don't know what to do. So they're taking it out on others. How do we get, how do we release that and turn it around? Well, you know, the, the counseling and, and therapist institutions will attack me for this, but marinate, <laughs> in your, marinate in your pain for a little while. Okay. Right. Pain is not the end of the world. It really is not. And, and, and whether it be emotional, physical, it, there's going to be a healing from that process. And I'll give you a story that, you know, very long time ago, like in the early, early 90s, I got fired from a job. Mm -hmm. um, and I did a great job. I was doing a great job. And be, with success comes ego and arrogancy. Yeah. But I didn't see that part. I just saw the great job and how they fired me unjustly. You know, I went and started a business and everything else like that. As I look back and I tell my story, bless 15 years now, and I said, I deserve to be fired. Because even though I had great success, the job didn't change. I still had a boss. And this was the same person. Not My success didn't make me better than that job, that person. I had to, and I, and, and because I wasn't listening or I was challenging him, I should have yeah. been fired. So right. I deserve to be fired. So, but that thinking didn't come about um, overnight. Yeah. It, it, it took a long time to come to that process. But what did happen? is I learned from my termination. Yeah. So I kept my mouth shut, you know, <laughs> and did yeah. what I was supposed to do on other jobs. 
Right. So this is what I mean when I say that you marinate in your pain. Not everything that you feel was done wrong to you was is wrong. Right. Some things need to happen because of some behaviors that you need to lose. Right. Very true. Along the way. And when, no matter how good you think you are, <laughs> you're not the judge of you. Other people are with it. You know, exactly. believe it or not. <laughs> you know, no, I'm the, no, I'm, you're not the boss of you. Other people are going to be the judge, especially you're going to work in, on, in their jobs and their companies for their team. They're going to judge you. Uh, yeah. and, and, and you're going to have to learn to get along that way. And you're going to have to have a duality of your spirit. Yeah, yeah. And you're going to have to be able to be centered and balanced from that process, you know. Right. And if that's a hardship for you, then you're going to have problems. You're going to create problems uh, for yourself and you're going to have problems in your thinking and your fear and anxiety, your narcissism, your uh, victimization. These kinds of things are going to be grafted into the kind of person you become. Right. Which is not healthy from that process. Yeah. Oh, 100 percent. But if you can look at yourself and say, I mean, when you look in the mirror, you don't say, man, God, you knew what you were doing, man. <laughs> you picked the cream of the crop here. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I thank you for your good eye and picking me. <laughs> right. Oh, you know, you got you to gotta be real. Sinner saved by grace. You know. Right. A hundred percent. But by faith, you know, there go I and stuff like that. So. And, and all of the things and, you know, grew up in the Baptist church and, you know, past of the church now and these kinds of things. So you come to that understanding. But anyway, that's that's why I would tell them, you know, um, marinate in your in, in your pain a little bit, you know. Don't, don't, that's don't a, yeah, that's a actually really good answer. And I think that was that's something that I think I think could really help people, you know, and uh you know, I, I think that's very beneficial. Now, tell me a little about each title of your book and what each book is about and where people can find each book. Well, the first book I wrote in 2012 is called The Corporate Christian, Christian Beliefs Versus Corporate Behaviors. That's that dynamic I told you about coming on to the job, getting a job, feeling like you're being blessed, standing up in the Baptist church and testifying how good God's been to you and all these things there. And six months later, you hate the job because you're being told what to do. You don't like what's being done to you uh, right. and, and, you're, and you're upset. Or, you know, that same job that God bless you with. Now you have a girlfriend or boyfriend on the side, you know, yeah. and you're, you're, you're conducting an adulterous relationship from that process. Right. Or you know, all of a sudden now you're cursing too much and, you know, these kinds of things. So it was, so Christian beliefs versus corporate behaviors, the resisting right. and the liberating of the group in that aspect. And understand right. that God gave you the job not to change you to be bad, but to yeah. provide for you. You know, jobs right. are for provision, you know, and, and it's because you eat, because you have a home and bills. That's what it's for there. Right. The second one is the corporate Christian too, the battle for your beliefs. How do you hold on to your beliefs in political, politicized environments? How do you hold on to your beliefs as a Christian, you know, uh, uh, when you're going to be stigmatized or oh, you hate gay people or you they don't like Muslims and stuff like that. And, 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 and that comes through behavior that comes through behavior because you have to show the love of Christ more than just yes. speak it in a sense, you know, exactly. from that aspect, you know, and from that, and, 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 and if you operate in the fruits of the, uh, of, you know, the, these, which is love, peace, joy, goodness, kindness, you know, patience, long suffering, these, these kinds of things that people can't hold that against you. You don't have to participate in everything. Right, um, and you don't have to insult people's feelings, but you, you walk in grace and you walk in peace, in, in essence. And then the last one is the corporate Christian three of the series. Uh, my third, it's not my last book, but and that's called the hidden war. That's the war you. This is the war you're fighting on the inside. Right. This is the war that you know you put on your suit, uh, but before you put on your suit, you put on your armor. Yeah. Uh, the hidden war, because you're going to fight that, and that that's the Goliath you're going to face, and the David you never use. Right. Be inside yes. of you. You know, that so that that's gonna be the battle that you fight mentally. That's gonna be the battle that to make sure that you stay transforming and not conforming. That's the battle that you're always gonna check yourself to to make sure that 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 you're not being consumed and you're not being so consumed with career, success, finances right. that that you forget why you're there in a sense. Exactly. Exactly. 
And now, my last one is the American Christianity, Black Liberation, White Legalism, which came about from 2015 to present in reference to uh, the big discussions of, of, of divisiveness, book banning, race relations, uh, the MAGA movement, and that was happening in our country today. And just like you, I want to find out, you know, where this came from. Why are such smart, brilliant people uh, acting the way they're acting? Yeah. I mean, you look at a guy like Matt Gates, and he said, oh, my God, what a terrible person. This is a Green Beret. This is a guy that served his country. This guy, had, I believe he's a lawyer. He's a very smart guy. He's not an idiot by no stretch of imagination. I mean, he's a guy that you really want to sit down with and have a conversation with because he's smart, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, and then you say, well, you know, where's this coming from, you know, and, and this kind of this behavior, this belligerence in a sense, and, and, and at least from what we see, why do you feel that you need to be like that? You know, where's your grace and your gratefulness for you've reached the pinnacle of your, your, your career, your United States Congress person. Right. And, and so, you know, I did a history on the church and cause I felt that the church was extremely silent in the last seven, eight years of, mm -hmm. of our society, especially through the pandemic. Yes. And, you know, I researched, you know, you know, the, 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 the Ecclesia, the, the Nicene uh, mm -hmm. uh, Council, uh, Constantine, uh, the transference from these apost apostolic to the sub-apostolic fates and brought it all the way back up and found something around the 14th century in the Philippi de Sangria, Pope Leo, you know, uh, uh, and how their papal bull that they wrote that kind of brought it into a treaty in dealing with sub-Saharan Africa with that really opened up the Atlantic slave trade and the shadow slavery, and then looked at it that this really wasn't about, I don't like black people. This was all about sugar, sugar cane. Mm -hmm. Because the sugar cane yes. crop is the, the only natural crop that has more, done more disaster to humanity than, than anything than sugar. Nothing like that. Uh, no other crop is done like sugar. Right. Sugar cane, and it started in the Caribbean, and, and the 10 to 12 million people that were left in the Caribbean, and the 400,000 that were brought to the shores of America, all to satisfy European aristocracy. You know, mm -hmm. it was for chocolates, for coffee, for tea, and it also became uh, a stimulant for industry. Yes. It helped workers become work longer and stuff like that. And how that, that just took off, you know, because, and then greed stepped in and you have the massive profits through the plantations of rice and sugar, and the rice and cotton and stuff in the South and, and, and the atrocities that were committed because of that and the laws that were written that pretty much wanted to keep it slavery and perpetuity forever. Mm -hmm. you know? Some of the laws we cite in Virginia and the Carolinas and stuff that still were on the books and still on the books today, um, and 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 uh, how we and and brought it up to where we are today and this mindset of this stigma yeah. that every now and then is rolled out, you know. So we have never really conquered the division or divisiveness of race in America, and, no. and added other people to to the race to to the issue. So you've always had the race issue, then you've had the ethnicity. Issue, you have the Italians, you had the Irish, and all of them have kind of gone through, but they have found through subcultures to elevate themselves. Yeah. You know, uh, one way or another through staying in their groups, you know. Right. Buying from each other in, in, in the boroughs of Brooklyn or, or the Bronx, uh, you know, the, in the communities of Chicago and, and then building out from that aspect there. Um, yeah. And, it, and by no stretch of imagination was it easy, you know, and 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 a lot of those communities still carry a chip on their shoulders. They all talk about their grandfathers and great grandfathers, what they went through and stuff like that. And then and, and similar. So, you know, why are we feeding into this division? Yes. Why are we why are we making people choose? Well, it's in us <laughs> as people. Yeah. You know, it doesn't happen based on legislation, like I said all the laws we need but those are the books that i wrote and to examine them and they're kind of heavy but i think you'll get a good read it's a good history on the church it's a good you know introduction to corporate life and stuff like that it sounds amazing it sounds amazing where can people find your books they're all over the online bookstores amazon ingram sparks Barnes and noble kindle kdp uh there's a good special going on uh, uh there in the corporate christian series there um, you know that, and the the American Christianity was number one on Amazon for about three weeks. Uh, Excellent. In, in the um, Christian theology, liberation theology category, 
uh, through July and August there. So uh, tell the readers, go get it. I think they will really enjoy it. They'll have a really good read from that aspect. And they'll learn, really learn a lot uh, of things from that in reference to uh, the Amer American Christianity. Through the right. Corporate Christian series, they will, I'm sure, everybody on the planet can resonate with something in those books. Oh, man, I've been through that. You know? Yeah. I that, you know, we even give some case studies of, of how how you were raised can affect you and how you perceive yourself in the corporate environment. And, and we give a case study of a young lady who was the oldest child and was always taught as the oldest child, help your parents, take care of your siblings. You right. Know, sacrifice going out and hanging out to babysit and look out for them. And, and that nurturing mindset she took into the corporate environment that um, was not reciprocated, but used. Right. Yes. Uh, which made her very angry and jaded. And, you know, I'm always doing, doing, doing her. No one's doing for me. And, you know, right. I'm, I'm not seeing that in my merit increases and these kinds of things compared to everybody else. So, uh, and how do you overcome that? And we talk yeah. about those studies and we give her solutions and answers to that too in those books. That would be a great conversation for next time. I mean, I'd love to have you back on the show, but to talk about how when you're brought up in a certain way and your 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 mentality is, is focused on behaving a certain way, like a nurturer, a pleaser, because you you spent your life helping your family, helping your siblings. And then you go into the big corporate world and it's a backstabbing industry where everyone looks out for themselves. And then, like you said, the anger sets in. What do we do? That would be great for maybe another conversation. People, the corporate environment loves people pleasers. Yeah. And they take advantage of those people pleasers. They're easily manipulated. You know. They're easily manipulative. Yes. Very I true. would love to be back on your show. Just let me know anytime and we can have, even if we don't talk about the books, we can go into those discussions there about because because everybody was raised a certain way specifically, right? And and yeah. You know, and 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 you're always told to do good, treat people right, especially women. Yeah. Women carry that burden of perception. Yes, how they're perceived. The um, rock of the family, take care of the family. You know, right, uh, right. make sure you take care of your elders and make sure you do this and da da da. And then I you have know. people tell me all the time, "I'm not doing this. Right? I'm not going to do this." But I, they take advantage of me, and then an hour and a half later, oh, I got it done. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> I, I, because of fear. Yeah. They were afraid that somehow they didn't do it. I mean, that's how strong that 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 internal um, yeah. her, um what do you call it? legacy or, or culture yeah. is in them. It was raised that way. So they can't say no in a sense. The environment you grew up in that sudden, you know, right. it molds you into that person you are today. Right. And Absolutely. it affects you in a good way and in a bad way sometimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And even though you feel good that you did it, you feel bad that you did it because you know that it's not going to be reciprocated. Exactly. And, and I give answers to how to overcome it. That would be great for our next discussion. But I'll say one thing, you know, sometimes the simplest things like a pat on the back or a thank you or a kind word or phrase can be all that a person is looking for. And that's all they need. And when and, and when that's not reciprocated. That's where the anger and, you know, sometimes you don't have to do something back. It could just be the words of appreciation and, you know, making that person feel valued what they did. There was a purpose for it. And it was it was acknowledged and it was reciprocated in those words of kindness. That's all sometimes people need. And, 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 and that's true. That's true. But I'll say, but you have that promoter culture. Because yes. eventually when that first person finds out that everybody that that person is nurturing and helping all of yeah. a sudden is making 15 to 25 to 30 grand a year more than them. Yes. <laughs> that That's a cold, hard reality to deal with. Oh, sure. For sure. A hundred percent. And it, and it's very hurtful. Yes, it definitely is. Now, where can everybody find you on the website? Uh, I have a website. It's www.oewilliamsministries.com www.oewilliamsministries.com. My spiritual son, uh, who is a computer CIA, <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't write your passwords down, made sure he, I had the HTTP slash, so it's extremely secure site and all that yes. stuff. 
you'll find my books there. You can buy them there as well. Or you'll see something about the ministry, myself, my history. I, I, I got my master's degree in pastoral counseling from Liberty University in Norfolk, Fork, Virginia. I practice a, a solution-focused methodology. You know, in my clinical pastoral, I have over 2,500 hours of clinical pastoral counseling uh, with mental health and stuff in, in, in Kings County Hospital when I used to do, do the patients there. Yes. Um, and you'll see some of the work that I did. I've, I've, I've taken this methodology and I've trained clergy, imams, rabbis, pastors, police officers, or early childhood educators, you know, specifically in South Africa. I've done it in, in some of the townships and the police there. Oh. Yeah, so you'll, I've had some experiences and which kind of came to an end in 2019, mm -hmm. uh, back in 2020, but then you know what happened with that. And, yeah. And retirement and, and, kicked it. Yeah. Do you do any type of counseling now or you're just completely retired now? No, I still counsel. But I counsel people who want to call me. They'll come and we'll speak to them and stuff like that. So they can reach out to me and they can call me and from that aspect and, uh, or they can get my information from people like you guys and get the emails and they'll reach out, you know, and, and, and we'll set up some time to sit down and speak with them, see what they're dealing with. And, 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 and we do marriage and stuff, but mainly we kind of deal with the individual or what they're dealing with specifically in their professional life or their personal life and how they um, see themselves and not just in the world, but in their world. Right. Right. How they see that's excellent yeah that's excellent well this has been a pleasure pastor williams i am so glad you came on to the show i look forward to having you on again this has been thank wonderful. you so much thank you so much i really enjoyed it so and you yes. really know how to do a great interview it was just a conversation you know we just oh, need to have some coffee and in, in, in a living room setting right so <laughs> You know, I, you know, it's, if, if you, if you, if you can be a person where you could step out of your own self and really understand the people you're with and every, you could always, there's something and people think, oh, I'm not compatible. I can't talk to this person. I can't talk to that person. But like I said, we all come from the same, the, the same build up, the same personality, you know, we are unique in some ways, but we are very similar in other ways. And if you really understand that and really take that to heart and you really believe it, you'll find that no matter who you talk to, you will find things that you could relate to and talk to about. And, you know, you could have wonderful conversations with almost anybody if you open yourself up to the person. Yeah, 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 that, yeah That's what yeah. it's all about is yeah. open yourself up. And, you know, not everybody could do that, but you could learn. You could learn. Well, that exactly. Could... You know, and that's what you just said today. I had conversations of conversations. And, you know, like this interview you and I are having right now is a great interview. And, and I'm so glad you had me on your show. Um, sure. And, and you know, I look forward to the next time, you know. And, and God, But, you know, uh, someone told me that, you know, he said when two Christians meet and they should always walk away understanding that there's something in that person that I recognize and I like, in a sense. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Very true. Well, thank you so much for coming on this show. And, 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 and Pastor Williams, have a great day. Thank you. You too. Thank you so much. God bless you. Bye-bye. God bless you as well.